Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Momentum's uh, customer forum for our MYB Advanced customers. Uh, we're really happy to have you with us this afternoon and hope we can uh, provide you with a lot of informative content about MYB Advanced, what's been happening, uh, what's happening right now and what's going to happen in future. So my name is uh, Al Emery. For those of you who don't know me, Managing Director at Momentum Software Solutions. Just a housekeeping item or two. Uh, it works best uh, with uh, web meetings like this and, and Microsoft Teams if, if you could please uh, mute your microphone and uh, leave your camera off. It just helps save on bandwidth. Um, but do feel free to ask questions whenever you like. You can pop a question into the chat or you can raise your hand using the little icon there. So thanks everybody for observing those. The agenda this afternoon, uh, I'll provide an update, uh, a quick update on what what's been happening at Momentum and what our plans are. Um, we have uh, a couple of senior people from MYB with us, which is which is fantastic. Uh, James and Jean, who are going to be talking about uh, MYB uh, and MYB Advanced. Um, there may be a little bit of crossover of content because we're going to highlight uh, some of the key improvements in the 2021.2 uh, major release, which some of you have already had and a number are scheduled over the next few weeks. Uh, and Glenda from our consulting team is going to take you through those. Uh, we also have Arsenio Mendoza from Dicker Data. And Arsenio is a Microsoft uh, Dynamics uh, practice lead, and he is going to introduce you to the exciting world of Power Apps and Power Automate and things that businesses can do uh, in many cases with little or no assistance to uh, work in a cloud world. Um, so you should get some good insights from uh, Senio. Uh, we'll introduce you to our MYB advanced team, which has grown substantially over the past 12 months, so I'm sure you'll see. Uh, and then we have Glenda again, and she's going to do, uh, I guess, a bit of training uh, that you can watch and even uh, work along with on a few areas of, of NYB Advanced that um, you may not currently use or may not currently use as completely as you could. Um, so things that you can take away and use immediately, we think you'll enjoy those. Uh, and then we have Mark Stafford from Trailed, who's going to be talking about the impact of cybercrime on Australian business. So lots to cover. We do have a 10 minute break part way through so you can refresh with a cup of tea and, and a snack. Uh, so let's get going. Um, Momentum are a growing business. Uh, we are fortunate to be, I guess, in cloud ERP software, which is a very popular uh, thing, uh, certainly since COVID, uh, where uh, many mid sized businesses and, and you guys on this call are obviously amongst them have a uh, transition to cloud ERP software. Uh, we have over 245 customers now using the different ERP products that, that we sell and implement. Uh, so we've grown a lot. Um, in particular, we uh, have specialized to, to do a degree in manufacturing and also construction. So we have a number of customers using the manufacturing edition or the manufacturing module of MYB Advanced and, and a number of potential new ones we talk to all the time and quite a few in construction as well, uh, which is a relatively new addition in MYB Advanced uh, in the last 18 months, I would say. Uh, our total team is now around about 35, so we, we uh, growing quite quickly to make sure that we've got enough consultants to, to meet the demands that our customers have. Um, so it's a photo of the team at our uh, quarterly clam bake we had last Friday. Uh, and we're really focusing on making sure that we're providing the right uh, level of service and customer experience to, to our clients. 
Um, and I'll touch on that in a little bit more detail in a few moments. Uh, last November, we acquired a, an office in Brisbane, so we've established a, our team in, in Brisbane. We, we already had a small team, but it was growing that quickly. We, we outgrew our Castledean office and moved to Brendale, where we'll be for many years to come. Uh, we celebrated our 12th year in business and uh, we employed 12 new people. Uh, so a lot of growth uh, at Momentum um, and we hope you're sharing similar growth. Share those things. Yeah, 12 months. Uh, I guess our focus is on you know, continuing to improve the experience for advanced customers. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the upgrade process. Uh, the upgrades bring a huge amount of new features. Advanced is a rapidly developing project uh, uh, module with uh, improvements coming all the time. Uh, so the upgrade process itself is more to make sure that that happens smoothly and thereafter we're looking to uh, be a bit more proactive in talking to our customers to then start to utilise many of the new features. Um, as well as uh, making sure that people are aware of the rapidly growing ecosystem of add-ons that, that Advanced has attracted because of its um, API capabilities. Uh, continuing on the customer focus, we, we really like to celebrate anniversaries with our clients. So people who have been uh, with us for five or ten years, and there are quite a few uh, customers that have been with us, in, in fact, since we started trading. Um, so we really like to make sure that we acknowledge uh, longevity of, of our customers and, um, and do that uh, in a fun way. Uh, so our, our first guest speakers, we want to introduce uh, the MYB team. We have James Brading and uh, Gene Fulop. Uh, James is segment product manager at MYB, and uh, Gene is the product manager at MYB for the advanced ERP solution. So I will hand over to James and Gene. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Al. So let me start Say good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Brading. I am the segment product manager from uh, for MIB Enterprise Products. And essentially what that means is that the team and I are responsible for a portfolio of products within the enterprise division, including advanced business, advanced payroll, and several of the other products. So I'm not going to talk for very long, but I do want to just start the session by giving a bit of an insight into the MYB Enterprise mission and focus. Gene, could you move over to the next slide? Thank you very much. So our mission in enterprise is to future-proof our customers' success by providing the platform for businesses to survive and succeed in a digital first world. So which in summary is that we exist to help future-proof your business. So whether that is helping to create efficiency in your operations or maintaining compliance with regulatory body bodies, or looking to grow your business, we want to be able to be there to support you through the process by providing a platform for business that will deliver to those expectations in an easy and simple manner. Now, that is our mission, and that's why the enterprise division of MYB exists. Gene, can you move on, please? So questions we often get is, what does it mean what do we mean when we talk about a business management platform and, and how can we help you? So to understand that, we need to understand the principles of the platform. So firstly, a platform needs to be connected and this doesn't just relate to the products actually making up the platform such as ERP, payroll and workforce management. Those obviously need to be tightly integrated, but it needs to go beyond that where a platform needs to provide sets of integrated, interconnected workflows, linking in with customers, suppliers, and other key trading par uh, partners. And a platform that can grow and adapt to your needs and requirements. So we have a lot of programs of work in place to reduce integrated, um, integrated workflow friction points and provide extended integration points beyond what are currently available today. A platform also needs to be adaptable to meet the changing needs of the surrounding environment 
and the varying requirements of different industries. So with our experience in compliance and our focus on the ANZ market, we can support you through the regulatory requirements. And it's an area that we continue to invest heavily in is how we can support you in compliance as well as advocating for business, advocating for business with governments, um, both in Australia and New Zealand. We've also built a strong set of industry knowledge and we continue to build out our skill sets in those different industries to be able to ensure that we're delivering the right features and workflows to be able to support your businesses more and more. And a platform also needs to support the ability to be decisive, to provide you, our customers, with not just data, but insights into your business that can help as well as assist you with operating your business. So this is where we at MYB are really focused on delivering to be able to support our customers to be able to survive and succeed. So now I'll pass you across to Jean, who will take you through some of the specifics relating to the products. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your session. Jean, over to you. Thanks, James. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Jean Fullop, the Product Manager for Advanced Business. And uh, today I'll be talking, taking you through the major features that was released in the 22 autumn release, which I'll briefly touch on uh, covering the support of multi-base currencies, uh, field service, distribution and platform. The MYB Advanced uh, Business Teams mission, so I just really want to touch on this with you, is to enable businesses uh, to grow their profit while reducing risk by providing a set of connected workflows to manage those business activities and facilitate the confident decision making, which is actually represented by uh, three key pillars. The first one is the localization of the Acumatica releases into the ANZ region. So that's looking at uh, broadening and streamlining how our customers benefit from the new core capabilities. We then have provide best in class functionality to support the growth of our clients. So that's looking at broadening the set of business workflows that can be managed. And lastly, we have the delivery of the technology solutions to provide the workflows, streamlining business operations and automating those key capabilities to enhance our customers experience. I also wanted to touch on the number of features that we released uh, within the autumn release. And so there are 89 total features. So 11 major features of which represents 14% of the total features released. And there were 78 minor features, which is 86% of the total features released. So if we break this down, it works out to be about 51% of those feature enhancements is across financials, uh, CRM uh, integrations, and 48% spread across system, platform, uh, field service, manufacturing, projects and construction and mobile. So if you refer to the chart, you'll notice a further breakdown of the number of features released per year or per area. So here is a breakdown of those uh, major features that we released, which I'll briefly touch on. So we have the support of the multi-base currencies for financials, distribution, projects and construction. We have field service, which is tracking the profitability of items in a service order, uh, new service contract billing types, quick create of service documents from other documents. We've got manufacturing, which has the visual product scheduler. Uh, there are also some platform changes for data sorting in the table widget. There's a new CRM task subscriber on the business event form. There's a new toolbar and a DAX schema browser in the GI and reports. So I just touched on some key highlights um, for for this, the recent release that we've put out. So the key highlights, and we're absolutely super excited to let you know that multi-base currency is now available, which we have, we which we know has been a request from customers uh, for a while. And the multi-base currency is now available uh, in the latest release where we are catering uh, to certain customer workflows and we'll be continuing to provide additional workflows uh, through subsequent releases. So businesses that have uh, international subsidiaries and operations will benefit from being able to manage their international customers and suppliers by creating multiple related companies in the same tenant. So reporting information uh, across multiple tenants is now reduced where all of the information can now be reported on from within a single tenant. Uh, so for example, 
As a CFO, I can now choose to view real-time information for company New Zealand or Australia or a consolidated view on a single dashboard. So multi-based currency will allow companies to share customers, suppliers and inventory items, including the ability to centralise approvals along with preparing real-time reports across companies. So with multi-based currency support, separate companies can transact in their preferred base currency. And multi-based currency supports uh, inventory, sales orders, purchase orders, and expense receipts uh, and claims for projects and construction is available. Also just wanted to list out um, features that will be released in subsequent releases. So there's the deferred revenue management. So this is covering the multi-based currency. This is deferred revenue management, uh, contract management, fixed asset management, uh, Dunning letter management, purchase requisition, time management projects, uh, customer portal, customer management, uh, service management, manufacturing, commerce integration, and Procore integration. So key features uh, for field service. So optimizing and you know, streamlining those customer workflows is always forefront of mind for us. So enabling managers to gain a holistic view, uh, improving efficiencies with scheduling appointments, uh, creating service documents with the different billing types, along with tracking the profitability and costs of items, which includes type, um, which includes stock, non-stock um, non stock services and labor. Uh, which is tracked at the service order level. So for example, um, items include service orders, enables a manager to view which areas are left pro less profitable. So this workflow will help managers gain a view of all employees and the current schedule capacity, enabling better utilization of their time. So companies that have teams of people working on a single job can specify the number of staff as opposed to a single technician on one job. So we've got key highlights for uh, distribution. So there we've got the order management, so a centralized management of those sales activities and simplifying the procurement process helps businesses save time. So you can now automatically create uh, customer refunds from a sales order or invoice, uh, create a purchase order where products are delivered direct to a project site, including the ability to facilitate cross sales, upsells, and then item substitutions during that order process. So managing your advanced warehouse needs has just gotten gotten easier with the paperless picking, where warehouse managers now have the ability uh, to prioritise pick lists and determine who will pick those items through a managed queue. The paperless picking feature allows pick, pack and ship to operate in paperless mode, and the amount of paper warehouses use for pick lists, and fun fact here, did you know that it counts for about 26% of landfill waste, which is now reduced significantly with the automation capabilities. So paperless picking will help the small uh, to medium companies where they are looking to uh, streamline their operations and, and minimize the number of manual processes, enabling efficiencies uh, within their business. So warehouse management was always seen for those larger companies as, and is now actually available to those small to medium businesses. So with multi-base currency, so what is the problem we are solving? So companies with uh, different base currencies can be set up in the same tenant. Companies can share customer supplies and inventory items as long as it, it, the base currency of a company is the same as the selected uh, customer supply and inventory items. The ability to centralize approvals, process inventory sales orders uh, and purchase orders. And we've got processing of expense rates, receipts, claims for projects and construction, and then set up a joint projects for employees that work across companies. Just also wanted to note what's coming up for multi-base currency um, is that deferred revenue. So this is where deferred revenue subledger can be used. So this is coming out in our next release. So customers will be able to review the currency of the deferral schedules on all data entry forms and reports. Uh, there's multi-base currency for fixed assets. So this is where uh, all fixed assets related forms that produce GL transactions. So the system verifies that the branches specified in those transactions have the same currency and that you can now review the currency amounts and total amounts in all those fixed assets transactions on a multiple uh, multiple data entry forms and reports. So the multi-base currency for projects. So this is where a system now verifies that base currency specified in the project related documents, which corresponds to the base currency of the branch. Okay. 
So now I'll provide an update uh, on our roadmap and what's coming. Uh, first, before I jump into the roadmap, um, you probably noticed that you heard, heard me say autumn and spring release. Uh, so I just wanted to really let you know that we're going seasonal. So we're actually changing just the numbering. So we're changing it from autumn and spring. It just makes it that much easier that we have uh, two releases a year and they'll be called spring or autumn. So that will tie in with the whole deployment process. So from an advanced uh, business product roadmap, so here is the current roadmap for advanced business. And I uh, just wanted to call out, as I mentioned before, we've got the two releases this year, and as noted, will be called spring and autumn. Um, I will provide an update on the next slide as to what has been done and what is our focus and what's next. So what is being done is so we've delivered uh, the recent release, which we uh, are currently deploying right now for, to the first cohort of customers. Um, so what is our focus is we're looking to provide a secure login process by enabling uh, single sign-on. Um, so what we'll be doing is we'll be providing a customers with a single sign-on access utilizing one set of credentials, which enables our customers to have that centralized control over who accesses their systems. And we want to give our customers or your customers a peace of mind of minimizing any security risks uh, to your operations. We then have the um, hosting of the email AI capability. So that's machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence capability that we're looking to add into the product. So Acumatica released the document uh, recognition and AI capabilities a while back. Uh, and the benefit of implementing uh, this work is that what we've got to do from our perspective, we've got to set up a service to be able to help you customize, optimize the information that's coming through. Um, and in order for, for us to take that uh, full advantage of that capability, so it's MYB, the service provided by Acumatica is currently not offered in the ANZ region. And this is due to the customer requirements or country legislative restrictions not available in this region. So what we are looking to do is looking at hosting and managing that services. So providing long-term benefits to utilizing the machine learning language and the artificial intelligent capabilities. So this requires investigation to understand what's required to implement and support this. But what it will do is we'll be able to provide the uh, AP bill recognition. There's also um, expense claims and there's also business, um, I've lost the name, but uh, business cards which you can scan in. And then we have, we'll be then looking at the next release, which is coming up. So this is going to be called the spring release, which is due in September. And the first lot of cohorts will be, or the customers will be upgraded to kick off around uh, November. But prior to that, there'll be sandboxes, the usual process that we go through for that deployment process. So just want to call out, there are actually two steps to delivering a, a release, uh, which requires, first of all, integration, uh, integrating that release and then delivery of it. So with every Acumatica release that we will continue to obviously broaden and streamline how uh, you, our customers, will benefit from those new capabilities released in the next release. And there are several key features in that spring release, along with the continued uh, support of the multi-base currency throughout the product. Um, and that's my update for today. Thank you. Over to you, Al. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, really appreciate the uh, update from uh, Jean and James at MYB. Uh, and we're going to take a bit of a deeper dive into some of those upgrade features uh, that are available in the 2021.2 release. Um, and just to clarify, so not, not everybody is yet upgraded. The upgrades go for quite a period of time, several months, in fact. Um, so we, uh, your individual sites are put into uh, cohorts or windows uh, where the upgrade would be occurring um, and we're communicating with our customers as we go through that process and making sure that the upgrade goes as smoothly as possible. So over to you, Glenda. Thank you, Al. Um, I'll just share my screen. So 
Um, basically, yes, we're going to go through some of the, the features um, through the major upgrade um, that's happening at the moment. Um, as Al mentioned, um, our upgrade process is, um, it is a, a scheduled time over different cohorts. And, and what Momentum would propose to do is to ensure that that continuation of your existing functionality post the upgrade. That's why we issue sandboxes to our, all our clients um, and we can provide um, the effective work impact so that we don't have any issues or major problems going through from the upgrade. Um, we also provide the ability to assist you with any identifying features um, that can enhance your um, advanced experience. So uh, some of the features that I'm going to go through um, have already been touched on by Jean, and thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to go through a couple that a few features um, in the different areas, just to show you a few screenshots of how um, those features can assist you um, in your business. Firstly, I want to look at the accounts receivable payments and the cash, um, cash refunds. So when you want to apply uh, a, a receipt, you can actually apply a receipt or a payment to um, an unreleased AR document now. So that can be a sales order, a sales invoice, an AR invoice. And to do that, you can access the um, payments tab on the screen, which would then actually give you the ability to create a new payment. Now, in the past, we haven't been able to do that, but now we can actually create a payment from that screen, it populates a very small window um, where you can process the information. That information sits as a balanced transaction and you can actually release that transaction. The payment doesn't get closed until the finalization of the actual document, um, so that you can, but you can actually track that information throughout the system. The next one that I wanna talk about is the customer refunds. Customer refunds previously used to have to you used to have to have a document to apply a customer refund. Now you have the ability to actually apply a customer refund without recording a customer refund in the system without applying it to any specific document at the time of entry. That can happen very easily by creating a customer refund in the payment schedule screen. It becomes an open transaction with an available balance. Moving on from that, um, there's some wonderful new features in the process bank transactions section as well. So processing bank transactions in the system, you can actually match multiple documents in a payment. So now we can actually select from, from a customer, re customer receipt, we can select multiple items to apply the payment against. Previously, it used to have to be a one-to-one -one match or using the create payment section and actually creating the, the match um, within that process. So you now have the ability to select the documents that are being applied to that payment through the bank, the process bank transaction screens. You also have the ability now within the process bank transactions to apply a bank charge or a fee charge to a document. Previously, that wasn't available. Um, we would have to do that through the actual cash receipts process um, or the payments and applications process so that we can actually apply a fee. That, does, that now has the ability to select a payment for a, for a particular customer's invoice and apply a specific bank charge to that. And the charge would be using the charge types. So the entry types or bank charges or charge type can be used to apply that charge. That's something that's very beneficial when you're doing overseas transactions, where you have a fee applied to the actual payment um, coming into your system. And another wonderful feature that's come through is um, and been long awaited for is the actual visibility of tax transactions within the system. So when you're creating a cash um, a, a disbursement, you can actually track whether it's um, GST inclusive or GST exclusive by creating a tax transaction. Similar to the way we actually create um, a spend money transaction, similar to um, 
the way you normally do it. The only difference now is that you can actually create the payment with your correct tax category associated to that particular transaction. That then allows us the ability to put a tax amount onto the transaction. If the tax zone hasn't, oh, sorry, back one. If the tax zone hasn't been applied to the, um, the cash account, you can actually select that tax zone manually and set whether it's a gross or net amount. So that would allow you to do your GST inclusive or GST exclusive. Very handy new feature coming through the system. Um, on the other side of um, the system, you've also got your distribution inventory management. And there's been a few changes that have actually affected throughout the different modules. So through servicing, service module, through projects and construction, and also, also their items upsell and cross-sell. Going into the, the field services side, the ability now to to track item cost and profit on, as, as Jean said, on labour items, on um, service items and inventory codes. There's a new tab um, on your service management, service order screen and the appointment screen called um, profitability. And on that, you will be able to see that match, see what the cost and profit of a particular item is. And at the top of the screen, it would have a summary of of the profitability of that particular service order. In the project side of things, there's a new feature um, that's been added to the system for the inventory tracking. Previously, when we had to do inventory tracking for projects, we would have to set up a warehouse location for each project and task associated to that particular project. So when you're actually receiving your items in, you'd have to make sure that you've got specific locations for every task. Big change that, that has been done now is that they have set um, two, three, two different levels of being able to track your inventory. You can track inventory um, through what we call a virtual warehouse now. So that the, the, the information is stored on, on the uh, items, um, but it's actually tracked by the project. There's two, there's two new features that actually include this. The first feature is called product, um, project quantity, and that's where the quantity is actually recorded against the project, but the cost of the quantity is actually matched by the inventory cost. Whereas the, the second feature, which is to track project quantity and cost, matches the quantity to the project and actually assigns the cost associated to the items that are purchased for the project itself. So it actually could be matched at a different cost to what your standard inventory is. There's a lot of information in the release notes in relation to this particular, um, particular feature. And it is um, very important to read up on that. Um, and, and also our Momentum team will be able to assist you. The next feature also is, um, is, hang on, next slide. The next feature that's come through also is called the project, project or construction is the drop ship, to shop, drop ship to site. So now you have the ability to create a drop ship for a project and actually have it drop ship to the site that you're actually working on. Those items are selected when you're raising a purchase order with a new document type called Project Dropship. When you select the inventory codes, the items actually are selected with, with um, either goods for project or non-stock for project. And when you actually generate um, the purchase order, the shipping details actually come from the site address um, of the project and are populated into the shipping tab of the project. And another great feature that's been added to the system is more of a retail feature, is the item substitution upsell and cross-sell. Basically what it's done is it's allowed us to create items, and I'll use this example, um, is basically ordering a chicken burger from, from, the, from a, a, a retail place or several chicken burgers. And you have the option to have um, either a cross-sell, which is adding fries or to, this, to the item. 
you can add um, free items. So you've got an additional item for a drink and you've also got a substitute item. So the substitute items are representative of where um, an item might be out of stock and hence the substitute item is what is recommended. So when that's processed through the system, um, the order, the, the colon, there are new columns added that show that information and it's actually flagged on your sales, um, sales orders. So you've got items that are flagged as a substitute and, and then um, items that have got a particular upsell. This information is also flagged in two different colours and you can select them as required and select the corresponding items for that. In the manufacturing area, there have been a couple of really nice new features added to the manufacturing as well. Um, Jean touched on the visual scheduling um, where you've got firm or finite scheduling, um, but there's also a brand new feature for lot, track, lot serial number tracking. The lot serial number tracking feature allows you to set a predefined um, item based on whether or not it is um, to be determined at the time of issue. So if an item is, is issued and the serial lot number is attached at that time, that information is a new tab on the production order called line details. And this will assign the number to the actual items, the stock items, as they move into the production. The other side of the item is basically, it becomes part of the material release. So the, the serial number gets added to the material release, and then that flows through the processes of the system. The second feature is basically when you actually define the serial lot number on completion of the production so that you can move all your products, finalise all your everything else till the final move um, is generated for the completion of, the, of the, the order, or the completion of the production back into stock. And at that time, the system then allows you to do what's called a late assignment. That late assignment allows you to add the, the lot number or serial number to the items um, at the time of the last move transaction. And to, to support that, Myob have actually created, um, sorry, yeah, the, the late assignment pops up as a separate screen and you assign the late assignment at that point. They've also added new reports to the system and new inquiries that will actually support the information and assist you when you're trying to find warranty details or if you need to do a recall on a product. Um, you can actually find the serial number or lot number um, through these reports. And the, the next part of the system actually shows you what the visual production is. So the visual production schedule is basically been coming for a long time, but it allows you to see information um, of the different work centers, of what's actually happening in the production schedule. And the color coding allows you to identify the different work centers. You can also see um, the little red marker here, the diamond marker, that tells me that there's a sales order that, that is requiring production. Where it is indicated that it's a red one in this case, means that it's a late production, but that can be reassigned and redetermined based on the production orders. So your scheduling can actually be managed and moved around in a very simple way. Um, so this one here, this allows me to, to drill down from the work center information and make my changes to the production order. It also tells me the information of the order and how and, and whether or not it's on time. So in this particular case, this green one is on time and we'll meet, we'll be met with the production. The ability to, to set um, firm production orders as well from the rough cutting schedule allows you to create firm orders, which are ones that you know you want to where you want to generate for um, stock to be held, or you've got your um, your un, un, unscheduled orders, which are just your your normal you know, we need to add them to the system. 
any any firmed order can also be changed to an unfirmed order and be able to be rescheduled. So when you're scheduling from your rough cut planning, you can actually un, un, unfirm a firm order so that you can actually move that. These are just some of the features, the key features that we have identified as, as items that need to be, that you, we can put forward to you in your, in your new release. Um, our release notes, the release notes for this upgrade are held on our, on our website and also through MyOB. Um, and if you need any assistance with the upgrades, please don't hesitate to contact um, us through the, through the website or through our support set, support team. Um, I think that sort of covers me, Al. I think back to you at the moment. Thanks, Glenda. And hopefully, uh, as you can all see, um, a huge amount of improvements that, that come in these major releases uh, from MYB uh, for advanced. And just circling back to a couple of those, the um, the improvements to the bank rec or bank transaction processing is a little thing, but a big thing. We we do we have had customers who have moved to advanced uh, if they were using bank feeds heavily in MYB account right or zero, they probably felt they took a slight backward step in that part of the software, uh, and this brings it much more uh, into that realm of being able to process things through one screen off the back of your bank feed. So the bank feed draws the data into your reconciliation or process bank transactions and makes that whole process much more efficient. Um, and particularly for uh, people in inventory, wholesale distribution, the item substitution especially. So if you have some generic items where if you don't have the item the customer ordered but have an equivalent and very similar item, that they're willing to accept. Um, that immediately potentially uh, helps you retain sales that you may have lost if you were relying on a manual memory, you know, your memory to say, well, I, I could supply them product B instead of product A uh, is a great example of um, new improvements coming to MYB Advanced. OK, uh, so next we have Arsenio uh, Mendoza, uh, Dynamics 365 Practice Lead at Thicker Data. Um, and so we're just diverting a little bit away specifically from ERP, uh, but talking about uh, solutions in a cloud world that are available to you um, in a number of ways through, through Microsoft. And without stealing Arsenio's thunder, he's the best person to um, tell you about some of those things. So over to you, Arsenio. Thanks, Al. Uh, lovely to be here. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. So wanted to obviously talk to you, you today about um, the Power Platform, bit of, bit of an overview of the Power Flo Platform. Um, so Microsoft's uh, Power Platform is what we call a low-code development platform, which allows any type of um, what we call citizen developers to quickly and easily develop uh, bespoke apps or automate, you know, manual processes uh, and workflows that you may have in your current um, uh, business applications. Um, so which is a bit of an agenda. So we're going to touch on the low code evolution. Then we'll, we'll go into why you should be considering the Power Platform. And then a bit of an overview of the platform itself, and then we'll jump into a couple of examples and, and use cases. So when we look at the low code evolution, um, from the early um, year of custom software, um, a lot of the actual applications that were developed for businesses were custom built for that particular uh, uh, company. You'll notice there's quite a number of different languages in here, such as Python, and Fort, Fortran, and, and COBOL that aren't really used. Uh, well, not so much Python, but COBOL and Fortran and aren't really used these days. They're quite old languages. Um, then we moved into what we call package software, so off-the-shelf software that you could actually purchase, such as MYOB, um, for example, or MYOB Advanced that are, are pre-packaged solutions that are developed by uh, vendors. So you've got ERP, you've got CRM, you've got uh, HRM solutions in, available in the marketplace. And a lot of these applications are 
uh, using some type of middleware to, to integrate with each other. We've now evolved into what we call low-code development, where it allows uh, you, you as a business and your own team to develop your own workflows and your own uh, bespoke uh, line of business applications using uh, the Power Platform. Some of the benefits of using low-code low develop platform. So what we found is it's generally a higher rate of success when you're implementing these types of projects. Because the projects are short in terms of the development cycle, we were talking uh, days and weeks instead of months and years, um, you can be very agile in, in the way you develop the actual um, uh, applications and the workflows that, that you're looking to uh, utilize within the business. It's generally loved by both the, the business and your IT teams. Um, whereas, you know, traditional development, it does tend to lag and there's cost, constant tension between IT and business when trying to deliver a custom um, uh, 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 de developed application. And then you've also got the uh, what we found is it breeds innovation uh, and new ideas on how you could utilize uh, the Power Platform for automating a lot of your manual processes uh, within the business. Microsoft is generally classed as one of the leaders in the low-code development platforms. Um, it's been uh, classed as a leader in low-code development for, for some time now, for a number of years now. And when we look at the low-code development platform, there's a number of reasons why people utilize a platform. So for growth, so you may have acquired a new business and you're looking to uh, seamlessly integrate those uh, back-end operations with your current business operations. Um, innovation, so allowing your team to um, uh, create new processes and new applications to you know, service your customers more efficiently. Uh, consolidation, so there may be data within different siloed systems that you want to actually um, consolidate and report on. Improve efficiencies within within the actual organisation, so you may want to you know uh, replace manual forms and uh, approval processes that are uh, normally done through email uh, and uh, automate that process uh, to some degree. Uh, accessibility, of course, so, you know, by developing these mobile applications that reside on uh, mobile devices uh, and, and tablet devices, it provides better accessibility to, to your business systems and it addresses citizen pain points. So again, removing any manual and redundant processes uh, because um, the IT um, uh, and the systems that are currently used are, are, are not proficient. I mean, most of you are obviously using some type of ERP solution and other maybe other types of third-party applications, whether it's payroll or workforce management or CRM. A lot of data resides in these applications. Um, and but what you also find is that a lot of these applications have processes that are attached to those applications. So you may have an ERP solution where it's using Outlook for your email. It could be using... Word documents, it could be using some type of calendar or some type of task management that is required for processing of, of orders. So a lot of these actual uh, processes can be potentially automated using the Power Platform. If we jump into the actual platform itself, um, there's a number of three, uh, there's a number of the key areas on the platform. So you've got Power Apps, which allows you to develop bespoke apps for mobile and tablet devices. Uh, Power BI, which is the business intelligence uh, tool for uh, developing your own dashboards and, and uh, interactive reports. And then you've also got the Power Automate, which is the workflow uh, automation engine uh, that's built upon the platform itself. All of these uh, three key areas can obviously be utilized within the existing Microsoft uh, stack. So if you're using Office 365 or SharePoint, uh, but you can also utilize these applications uh, with your own bespoke standalone um, applications as well. And of course, all of this resides on Microsoft Azure, which is Microsoft's um, infrastructure uh, platform for not only 
uh, the Power Platform and Dynamics, but also your Microsoft Office 365 uh, services such as uh, um, SharePoint and, um, uh, and Teams, for example. So when we look at the actual Power App side of things, you're able to develop uh, you know, apps that uh, utilize the native functionality of the actual devices. So you can actually utilize the camera, the accelerometer, the GPS tracking on your mobile devices and create bespoke applications around those uh, uh, capabilities of the device. Um, there's actually two types of uh, apps that you could develop. You could create what we call Canvas apps, which are uh, uh, it's like a custom app where you can develop any type of app from 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 start to finish. There's a portal um, app capability as well, so you can develop your own bespoke uh, portals or in, in custom websites. And you've also got what we call model driven apps, which is data driven, util, utilizing the uh, data platform on the Power Platform called Dataverse. So with Power BI, I mentioned it's the business intelligence tool uh, that um, a lot of businesses use for a lot of providing a lot of insights into the operational side of the business and their sales and, 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 and marketing efforts. Uh, what you are able to do is, is ingest a lot of your data into your Power BI dashboards and reports, whether it's cloud data or on-premise data, create your custom dashboards and reports, and then it, uh, um, expose those types of reports, whether it's through a web browser or a mobile device. You can even embed it in Excel or even in your own uh, custom built applications or even utilize Cortana as well. Power Automate is the workflow engine uh, that is used to replace a lot of these manual processes, whether it's approval processes or other types of uh, processes. Um, utilizing uh, the low code uh, platform to design your workflows from start to uh, start to finish. So you can utilize you know the built-in integration with Outlook, for example, to notify people when an approval has come through um, and create those tr uh, triggered actions based on uh, uh, conditions uh, for, for the given uh, processes that you're looking to to, to automate. Uh, jumping into the back end here, so you've got the ability to integrate other third party applications with the data layer of the uh, of the Power Platform, which is called Dataverse. So it's a essentially a database platform where you can create your own custom um, uh, database that integrates with the bespoke applications and workflows that you're looking to uh, automate. So, for example, you may uh, Pulling data from your ERP system or your CRM system into Dataverse and utilize that information on the uh, applications that you develop on, on, on the Power App side of things. Now, utilizing Dataverse, you do have what we call pre built connectors. Um, as you can see here, there's quite a number of them. You've got over 250 at the moment uh, pre-built connectors, some standard ones, of course, such as Google Drive, Salesforce. Uh, you can even connect to on-premise data through a SQL Server connector. Uh, and you also have the ability to create your own custom connectors as well. So if you, you do have happen to have a third party application that uh, has an API or a web service that you can um, utilize, you can create a, a custom built connector to that data source and use uh, Power App to manipulate and update and read that information from that third party system. Um, yeah, so just, as I mentioned, there's over 250 pre built connectors that are available uh, on, on the platform itself to connect various uh, uh, types of data, whether it's cloud or on premise. What you also have available to you is, is what we call industry accelerators. So if you're working in a specific industry that requires some specific functionality, such as, for example, in the not-for-profit industry, there's an industry template that builds on top of the, the Dataverse platform to allow you to manage constituents, uh, manage donations, manage grant and awards as well, uh, and store that information uh, in a central location that potentially can also integrate with your other uh, applications, whether it's your ERP or CRM. 
Now, if we go into the actual uh, different types of data sources that you can build apps from, so you can build uh, Power Apps from not only Dataverse, but also your existing Microsoft workloads, such as Excel, SharePoint, uh, SQL. Uh, you can even pull data from, as, as I mentioned earlier, through other cloud services as well, whether it's Dropbox or Google Drive or some other type of data source as well, using those custom built, con uh, so, sorry, those pre-built connectors. Dataverse is the database pl platform that uh, majority of uh, companies use for their um, um, uh, for their backend database for for the Power Apps and and the Power Automate uh, flows that they run. So you can utilize the data first platform for building out your different tables and relationships uh, to to the uh, uh, information that you may store in other third party systems. So you can use the data connectors, whether they're custom or pre built connectors and utilize either Power Apps or the Power Automate Flow or Power BI to, um, to, to actually uh, expose that data and utilize that data whether it's for reporting purposes or for actual processing uh, transactions. So this is just the just a, a, a brief screen, screenshot of the actual workflow. It's again, it's a low code development platform, so you can just drag and drop the different types of triggers and actions uh, through a flow. So in this case, we're, when a record is created in an opportunity, it's going to look for an actual condition, and then go through the workflow, and you you build build the actual uh, conditions and what actions you want to actually trigger as part of that workflow. So it could be. Uh, an approval workflow, as I mentioned earlier, or some other type of a workflow where it's um, taking a condition and then maybe updating some information in a third party system somewhere else. From the Power App side, you do have the ability to obviously design your own um, uh, bespoke apps. So whether it's a mobile or a tablet device, you can create different types of um, mobile and tablet um, applications uh, just by using the drag and drop uh, nature of the design studio for Power Apps. Um, and there's also a, a downloadable um, app that you can actually in install on your Windows, iOS and, and Android devices, where it'll, as I mentioned earlier, it will we'll take the native uh, functionality of the device, whether it's your phone camera or your GPS or your accelerometer, and utilize those uh, uh, features within your app um, uh, if required. And you can really design any type of app, you know, from start to finish, whatever the design look and feel is, you have full control of that. You can, you know, uh, embed images, uh, your own corporate colors, uh, different styles of fonts, font sizes, uh, all the way through the, the, the app application experience. And of course, you also have the ability to build out portals as well and utilize that business uh, data uh, and expose it within a portal in a secure environment. So you're able to provide, for example, self-serve capabilities in a portal to your customers where they can log in using either Azure AD or some other type of authentication method, whether it could be even their LinkedIn or Twitter Twitter account or, or, or Facebook account. You have those capabilities to, to set up those types of authentication. Um, and once they're authenticated, you, you're able to expose information from your uh, Dataverse uh, uh, tables uh, in, in, in the portal itself. And then lastly, AI Builder, which is the built-in art artificial intelligence uh, engine that allows you to further extend the capabilities of the apps that you build. So, for example, there's a number of pre-built AI models in the uh, AI builder. So you've got a business card reader. Um, there's key phrase extraction, the ability to uh, detect language or, rec or text recognition or even sentiment analysis. So these types of things further enhance the capabilities of your app. So you may, say, build out a, um, uh, a business card uh, capture uh, app where if you're for an event, so you can actually take a photo of someone's business card, it'll take in the data from that business card and save it to Excel or SharePoint, for example. Those are the types of 
capabilities that you can build out using the AI engine uh, of the Power Platform. And lastly, just a couple more um, uh, use cases and examples. So this is a, a company called Autoglass. Um, as you can see, they started off developing bespoke apps back in April 2017. Um, and by October uh, and December of that year, there are up to nearly a dozen uh, different apps used across several hundred users. And then now to a point where they've, they've really ramped up the different types of apps that they utilize within the business, um, over 40, uh, uh, going up to actually over, over 50 uh, apps uh, and over, used over across 1,400 staff uh, within the organization. This is a bit of an example of some, some of the apps that they've developed. So this one's for fleet checks, so checking the vehicles when vehicles come in for service. Uh, so they're able to actually develop those apps uh, for their, the, the, their staff to utilize on, on the mobile devices out in the field. And then lastly, um, you know, this is just one of the, the more popular ones that partners generally tend to develop in customers. So, um, you know, time entry or clock in, clock out uh, and time sheeting um, uh, applications, uh, allowing staff to easily clock in, clock off um, and have that save whether it's in your payroll system or, or, or some other third-party data source. So hopefully that gives you some good insights into how you can utilize the Power Platform in your business. Uh, talk to Al and the team at Mentor about uh, how you can get started and um, I'm sure he'll be able to uh, assist in um, working with you on, on helping you develop those apps out. Perfect. Uh, thank you Arsenio. Uh, thanks for uh, that overview, uh, we wanted to, I guess, provide something a, a little bit different that gave uh, customers um, an introduction into what's possible in uh, cloud apps. Um, another use case scenario I can talk about is the use of Power BI, which which actually integrates with MYB Advanced. Um, and where Power BI might work well is if you have people that uh, do not use MYB Advanced, but want dashboards reporting, which might come from MYB Advanced, as well as multiple other systems, be they cloud or on-premise, and produce uh, a suite of dashboards for people in the business, uh, you know, with data coming from various places is, is one good example. Um, so we're at break time. We're pretty much smack on schedule. So uh, feel free to grab a cup of tea or a water or whatever. Uh, you need to re-energize and we'll be back with our training session with uh, Glenda in 10 minutes. See you then. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had uh, a good quick break. Uh, so we'll get cracking right away with a few updates. I uh, did want to introduce uh, you to our MYB advanced team, which you, as you can see is quite a large team. Um, most of them are working, so many of them aren't on this call, but if any of you are, feel free to turn your camera on and say g'day. Um, but across our team, we have uh, Christian, Philip, Glenda, Tarek, Nick, Joe, Blair, Kathy, Nicola, Janine, Ishan, Ewan, Scott, Ella, Skipper, Pankaj, and our tech team made up of Steve, Roderick, and Action and David Wallace is Customer Success Manager. So um, it's always nice to put a face to the name and we just wanted to give you a quick opportunity to, to say g'day to any of the team. Hi, everybody. It looks like I'm the li only lonely one. Oh, Glenda's here. Okay, moving along. So I did want to touch on customer success quickly. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we want to work with our customers more proactively than, than perhaps we've had the capacity to do um, in the past to uh, stay in touch. Uh, and we know that because businesses change over time. I know my business has, um, and that can be due to various reasons. You have new product or service offerings that you want to start doing. Uh, your business just needs to change its process a particular way to stay competitive. Um, could be new entities that, that you need to create because you've acquired or establishing a new part of your business or new divisions or departments. Can be new people. 
um, or new investors. So all of those um, uh, are triggers for needing some help um, and possibly needing you know, to refine or utilise even more uh, parts of your ERP uh, that you may not be using at all or maybe not fully using. Um, so our, all of our consultants are on board with having those conversations with you, but in particular, David, who's joined us recently as customer success manager, will be contacting uh, clients on a regular basis to have those conversations on where, where you're at with your business growth journey or evolution, um, and how can we help? Uh, so that can be as simple as we need some training, uh, or it could be, you know, uh, a significant project creating a new pro creating a new company or implementing modules that, that you don't have. Uh, either way, we're happy to help. Um, some things that are important for you to know, I'm sure you already do, but I guess these are timely reminders. So uh, end of financial year is approaching. The process in MYB Advanced in the accounting side of things is relatively straightforward. Uh, payroll, there's things to do, uh, obviously, with your STP finalisation um, and various things. So we run a webinar for that. Uh, so please make sure that your payroll people are aware um, and have registered for that, especially if it's your first year end um, with payroll. Uh, you can register on our website. Uh, the other thing that's topical is single touch payroll phase two. Uh, which is an ATO initiative been going for quite a while, uh, where the ATO are looking to receive more information uh, through that single touch payroll mechanism uh, to make the compliance side of things for employers easier, to give themselves more information, no doubt. Uh, and also it'll last year, you know, meant that um, your uh, annual certificate was relatively not needed because employees have access to their MyGov to check their year-to-date earnings and things and, and do their tax. Um, most of our clients can already start using the STP Phase 2 functionality. Um, and our team in particular, Pankaj, is assisting with that. There's a lot of information on our landing page and uh, depending on your level of confidence, you can do most of the changes yourself. Uh, but equally, we're, we're happy to help with anything that's needed. Um, there are some customers that will require an upgrade in order to utilise the STP Phase 2 functionality. Um, and you shouldn't worry if you aren't able to access it yet, because MYB have an extension uh, through to August. Uh, so everybody will be covered within that time frame. OK, uh, so we want to move on uh, to training. Uh, and uh, the intention of this is to provide you with uh, some things that you can do yourselves that maybe you didn't realise you could. Um, and so Glenda is going to take you through uh, a little training session. Uh, you can uh, watch along or even log into your test system and have a go yourself while Glenda's uh, showing you. Uh, but it'll also be available on the recording. So over to you, Glenda. Thank you, Al. Um, let me just share my screen with you guys again. So I was going to go through two processes with you. Um, first thing I was going to go through is to do with the um, process banking um, information. So how we use our process banking transactions and creating um, what we call a bank rule. So when, we, when we're looking at our process bank transactions, you notice that we've got a, a list of transactions here and some of them are always recurring transactions, but they're recurring cash transactions. So we can create what's called a bank rule that will actually then allow us to automate that so that when we hit the auto, auto match button, the bank rule will automatically apply. To set those up in the system, so all we need to do is we need to select the transaction and create a payment. So on the, on the left, right hand side, we click on the create and we set the application to a cash transaction. And you have an option then to select 
the entry type. So for this particular one, it's a rent. So it's going to be um, a spend money type, which I don't have. So let's just make sure we've got that set up in the system first. Let's go and create an entry type. So an entry type for this particular type of transaction, I'm just going to call it spend. So it's going to be a disbursement and it's going to be called spend money. It's a cash transaction. There'll be no GL account offset because we want to set that as a default for it because you might have multiple transactions that would cause that. Now, a lot of people create these entry types and then don't realise that once you've saved them, you do need to link them to the bank account that they're associated to. So in my banking section here, I can go to my cash account. And I can select my Westpac account, which is the cash account that I want to use. And in here, underneath the tab that says entry types, I can actually click on the plus and add in spend. There's no limit to the number of types of transactions you have. You might want to use it for doing loan repayments that are automatically debited from your account. So the loan repayment, you don't need to set it up as a cash book, as, a, as a, an AP bill or anything like that. It just automatically debits from the bank account. So you can set those types of transactions up as well. So let's go back now. I've now associated that to my account. The only other thing that I do recommend that you do in here is looking at the tax settings for that particular spend money transaction. I can click on here and select the tax zone. So my tax zone is normally my domestic. And underneath the tax calculation mode, it's set to tax settings. So the default tax settings are what's set on that particular tax account. But I can actually tell the system whether I want it to be gross or net. So gross means it's going to be inclusive of GST. So you don't need to have a, you don't need to go and find the GST inclusive tax category for it. It will automatically assign the GST inclusive amount. If you have it as net, then it will be exclusive of GST. So I'm going to set this tax setting to gross. And I'm going to save. So my bank account now has the tax setting that I want. So let's go back to my process bank transactions. Okay, so I want to use my rent and I want to create a transaction that is a cash account transaction. So I select my module for cash account transaction. And in here now, I actually have my spend for a disbursement. And underneath that, I've got a section here called create a rule. So before I do that, I just might minimize my screen a little bit so I can get to the bottom of it. And everybody, hopefully everybody can still see my screen. I just had to minimize so I could get to the bottom section. So in here, I've got my amount. I want to actually select my offset account. So my rent expense account is what the one I want to have default and my sub account if we're using sub accounts. Okay, so at that point, I haven't created a rule yet. So I can save that record and I can create a rule because this is a monthly reoccurring transaction. So I can create a rule that will store that information for me and I can call it rent. Active. The matching categories the criteria for it is that it is a disbursement. That's the cash account that it's related to. I don't really need a transaction code for it, but the description that I need is rent. So that's the description that actually matches what comes through from the bank. In there, you can also have if it's matched case or if it's a wildcard, for instance, it might be fuel and it might come from BP. So you could put in BP and an and asterisk or a question mark, which would actually give you a wild card to identify any BP account that will bring in transactions you can associate to fuel. 
down the bottom here, I've got an amount. So I'm telling it every month, my equal amount is this amount, $5,000. And it's actually going to create me a document with spend money that's going to associate to that. So I can click on save. And now I can see that my rule has been created. So if I need to clear it, I can. So it's created my rule for me. And it's also told me my tax category is there and it's also associated the amount of GST. This is the new feature. So this is something that's brand new in version 2021.2. Half of you, some of you have already got this upgrade. The others are coming. There's a June, June requirement, June cohort coming and also a July and August. So everybody will have this feature very shortly. So in here, you can see my total amount from the bank is $5,000, but my tax amount is the, the actual um, GST amount from that $5,000. The other way that you can do that too is once you've done that, set that up, you don't need to create it every month. You don't even need to attach it every month. It will automatically find it. Down below here, I've got a bank charge. Now I know that I've got a rule in there for a bank charge. So if I go auto match, it didn't find it. Why didn't it find it? No, it didn't find my bank charge. Well, let's create it. Let's create the rule again. I might step through that again for you. So this one here is a charge. Okay. It's a charge for bank charges. So I'm going to create a rule, but my bank charges not every month are $20. So I'm going to create a bank rule. Save my record. I'm going to call it bank charges. Okay, it's again coming through as a disbursement to that bank account but it might say bank charges for something else. So I can actually put an asterisk in here. So the next time it comes through and I do my auto match, it might say bank charges for such and such. I also say I don't want it to equal that amount. I want the system to assign any bank charge to this particular transaction. So I can say leave my values at none so that it will match up automatically. I can click save and that's now been, that hasn't applied the rule. So let's just take that off, save our records. So my rent here, five, that tick. So my bank charges, if I go auto match now, no, still didn't find it. Not sure why that's happening, but I can actually say, tell you definitely that that's how it works. Okay, come back here. Let's have another look. Okay, let's take the auto create off here. Auto match. No. So the auto match has worked for the rent. It's applied it. I don't have my offset account. My sub account. Let's save. Okay. Definitely didn't apply that, did it? The bank, the bank rules are the feature that does work really well on my, on your data. I've used them quite a lot um, when pros when assisting clients with processing transactions. 
my apologies that it's not appearing as, as it should. Um, okay, Glenda, yeah. I think it gave us a good overview of how you set them up. So, yeah, it's fine. Sorry, Alan, Glenda, sorry, but in, I was playing with demo this morning. I may have broken it for you, Glenda. Thank you very much, Brian. I apologise profusely. I didn't, yeah. No, no problems. Okay, blame, so blame I'm going to move the salesman, I, yeah. I'm going to move on from there then. So, no, definitely they, I had them working this morning, so I just don't quite understand what, that's why it's happened. Okay, let's move on. So, um, I'm going to just hide those two things. The other things that I wanted to, to talk about today was about our finance reports. Maya um, kindly provide us with sample reports for our financials, our balance sheets, our profit and loss, etc. And those reports are found in a section here called report definition. So if I open the report definitions, you'll see there there's a list of codes in here. So these report definitions allow us to, to set some default parameters, to set default column sets and row sets. Now some of these reports don't always print the way you like them. So what we need to do is learn how to manage them to give you a bit more flexibility. So looking at this particular report screen here, I have my report at the top and I have what's called a row set here and I have a column set. Now I know the row sets here, if I preview this report, I'm gonna preview it for this particular company um, on the actual uh, ledger and for this period. I do have some data, but look, my sales, I just have, a, a group of information here for sales, but I don't know what general ledger codes they relate to. It's just a summary. My cost of sales, particularly a summary, and then I might have my bank charges, my freight charges, expenses, and so on. But I don't know what GL accounts they relate to. That's just a, just a term. So what you can do with these reports is you can modify the row set to show you the GL account that it's related to for a little bit more flexibility. So what I'm going to show you here, I'm going to go here to my row set. This is what the row set looks like. Now don't get scared because this is just basically the outline of what it is. But the key information that you're looking for is the data source. So in this particular row here for sales, sales hardware, it's showing me if I double click in here, my data set tells me it's looking at the class, so the account class for sales, and it's looking for the sub accounts in relation to that particular group. But it's only going to show me um, the amount information, and that's fine. But in the in the row description, I can actually change that to show me code and description or description and code. If I click on that and I go OK and I save, when I go back here to my report definition and I preview, I now have my GL account and my description. So a lot of times we want to save information and we want to group it together based on the account class. At other times, we want to show it in detail. So we can actually set up different row sets and different column sets to print on these reports. And from a row set here, you can see here, I can copy a row set. So you can leave the original set of system settings as they are and create a copy, give it a, give it a name. So I'm just going to call it MSS um, DPL and go copy. So I've now created a copy of that original row set. And I can make all the changes I want here without actually damaging the original set. To bring that, that particular one into play in here, all I need to do is change 
this to MSS. Might help if I save it. And there it is. So that's the same row set, but then I can make additional changes to it. And it's my row set that I want to run on our financials. The same applies to the column set. Again, with the column set. So in this particular report, it's only got year to date and period to date. Now I know everybody in Australia loves to have period to date first and then year to date last. So how do I change that? In the system, I need to change it in two sections, in the heading section and in the line section. At the top here, all I need to do is click on this column. Anywhere in that column and click on the arrow, move it one, one place. But I need to do the same down the bottom. And I need to click on the, a field in the column and click on the arrow and then save. So now I have my year to date at the end and my period to date at the beginning. Very simple change. The way I can check that my data is correct is down the bottom of the screen here. Again, you've got a data source. And that data source tells me what calculation am I using to determine my data for that particular column. So in that particular column here, I've got my amount type and my amount type tells me it's the turnover. So the turnover is the movement in the month. So that's correct for my period to date. And in here, it's my ending balance, which is also correct for my year to date. So I've made my moves on my columns here very simply. I'm going to go save. No, oh, I've just done a save before. Okay, I want to insert a column. I want to insert another column and put my budget in. Or I want to create a variance between year to date and period to date probably more so my budget, to insert a column into a column set. I click on the plus. It puts it at the end. It will always put it at the end. I then need to move it to the column, the row, to where I want it. So I need to do that in two places, in the bottom section and in the top section, so that my rows and my column, my headings and my row my columns all match up properly. In here now, I can simply pick up the information again from here. So I'm picking up a general ledger. The same information going down the page. Yes, it's for a row. All the information here is the same. I can set my rows to 140 characters. No, 140 pixels, I believe it is. Um, everything else is much the same. I want to format to the right. And down the bottom here, I want to show, I want to show that, I want to show my ledger. Here is my budget. And I want it to be my turnover and go OK. Now, when I looked at my, my actuals, I don't have a ledger in here. So the ledger is set based on, on the information either on the report definition or on the column set. So down here in there, I can now set my budget column. And up the top here, I can put in a description Period to date budget. And I can change this one to actual.
And I'm just putting a couple of little apostrophes around that because I need it to be a text field, not a formula, so that it will print on the report. So down the bottom, I've got my budget, I've got my actual, and I know they're both turnovers, and I'm going to save. And I go back to my report definition now, and I preview. Take something off here first. Let's take that one off there. I'm going to save that again because I don't want to ask what ledger I want because I've already told it. I've got in my column set my actual and my budget. The preview, company, and I now have a budget column. A little bit of formatting that needs to happen in there to match it all off. So that formatting information can also come from the columns and you can copy and paste format settings. Let me show you how. In my column set here, I can click on this period to date field. So in this line number, and I can go copy style. And in this one, I can go paste style. And I know that the field underneath has also got a, an underline on it. So I can also copy that style and paste that one across there as well. I'm going to save. Go back to my report. Refresh it and run. So now my column format is a little bit better. I could go into a lot more detail on how to format the column sets, the row sets. Al, do you have anything specific that you would like me to share? Or does anybody have any questions? Brenda, are we um, encourage clients to have a go? I think if you do it carefully, uh, you're not going to create a Disaster for yourself. You can do all this stuff in your test tenant as well. Um, and like anything that you're unfamiliar with, it probably takes some time and a little bit of trial and error at first. Um, but yeah, we did want to be clear that that you do have access to these types of tools and the help documentation does cover a fair bit of what field does what and what they do. Um, so you should be able to make certainly, uh, you know, basic changes like adding a column and that sort of stuff and some formatting quite easily. Uh, equally, if you don't have time, we're happy to do it for you and we commonly do, uh, but you certainly have the ability to um, do some of it yourself. So I might just reshare. Thanks, Glenda. Um, and before I introduce uh, Mark, it probably just a bit sum quick summary of that uh, and the bank feed rules. Uh, although uh, bank transactions and the bank rec is not the most exciting thing going, it's a good example of, of really business process automation. Um, and if uh, you or the person who does your bank rec takes the time to create those rules, uh, the advantage is they'll never have to enter that transaction manually again because it will just happen. Um, so over time, you can turn your bank reconciliation process into a very streamlined process. And that includes, you know, if you're a wholesaler or if you've got customers that pay you regularly because they receive your invoices and statements, you train them to put their uh, account number with you into the bank uh, text. Then you can create a rule off that to create the payment on their account um, and automate that part as well. So it can be used not just for expenses, but also for customer payments. Uh, so we now have uh, Mark Stafford uh, from Trailed, uh, and Trailed are our uh, favourite AP automation solution, but Mark is in particular going to talk about uh, the impact of cybercrime on Australian businesses, uh, and I won't steal any of your thunder, Mark, so over to you. <laughs> Cheers. No, thanks, Alan. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll jump in and I'll, I'll share my screen with a, a few slides and a, a 
some of the stats that we'll go through. Uh, importantly as well, I will try and keep it as light and easy uh, as this topic is one that can can get a little bit gloomy. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm sure you all want to end the session today on a high. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll jump in. Let me know if you can't see the the slides. Um, but look, it, it, it is sort of uh, an unfortunate uh, thing at the moment, uh, possibly not all that surprising with how much it's in the news, but uh, things like uh, fraud and cybercrime are becoming increasingly more important for Australian businesses and the impacts on the economy is, uh, are really becoming to start become much more significant. Uh, but what we find is when we're talking with people uh, about this issue, that whilst they have the awareness, they may have seen some of the news stories uh, and, and heard around the traps what's sort of happening. It's not really enough for them to make it really clear uh, how it relates to them and their business and what exactly they should or shouldn't do uh, to start to mitigate these types of things in their business. So what I'll go through today, I will go through some of the um, some of the stats and, and explain some of the unique gaps that mid-market businesses present uh, that, uh, that can serve as vulnerabilities for, for cybercrime. But then most importantly, at the back end, give you some actionable steps that you can actually take into your business this afternoon or, or into tomorrow uh, and really start to chip away at this uh, as, as a topic that is, is one that will be you know, a, a common part of business moving forward. And so look, to start with, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre is sort of the, the government uh, body charged with tracking, resource, researching and uh, educating all of us in this country on this particular topic. Um, there are many other independent organisations, but this is really the government led body. So if you are looking to do further uh, assessments or analysis, they're a great sort of resource to work with. And they're actually the source of a number of the information uh, stats that I'll go into. Um, but they have uh, put out uh, the latest update of their uh, uh, report and their position around cybersecurity in Australia. And whilst they're really clear in stating that there's no exact uh, incredible threat uh, specifically to Australian businesses at the moment, the broader climate uh, with uh, you know, ongoing conflicts uh, overseas and, and you know, pandemic and pandemic fatigue is really the part that's driving this position that they hold. And they're really urgently asking all Australian organisations, small, medium and large, to adopt an enhanced cybersecurity posture just to mitigate uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities across our economy. Because I jump into this next slide, unfortunately in the second year of, of uh, uh, pandemic sort of life and the, the digital transformation that accompanies that, uh, cybercrime is increasing across our economy. Um, from the uh, the first year into the second year of the pandemic, there's actually been a 13% increase of reports of cybercrime, and it's totaling a whopping $33 billion of self-reported losses. And so that's just the losses that we know about where, where the cybercrime has been identified post uh, and, and has been reported. So $33 billion is really one of those figures it's so large that it almost becomes not a figure but it becomes a statistic and so to try and start to break that down a little bit I'll, I'll sort of work down the page um specifically for australian businesses the one that we see as being uh, really common is the business email compromise tax and this is sort of a payment redirection scam whether it's through uh wages adjustments or or payables um they find their way into the business email and use and, and um sort of pose as, as a trusted figure in the organisation to have details changed and manipulated. And that, that's cost Australian businesses an estimated $896 million in, uh, in the second year of the pandemic alone. And then of course, in, in the pandemic related cybercrime itself, uh, in the second year, there's still been 1,500 incidences that have actually occurred. So all of that is totaling into, as you see there, eight minute, every eight minutes a cyber attack is reported. Uh, but this is actually faster than the 10 minutes, every 10 minutes that a cybercrime was reported in the height of the pandemic in 2020. And so, again, they're just really massive numbers that become really hard to, to start to relate to and actually bring back um, to, to your business, to your organisation. And so the one at the bottom is, is, the, is where I really want to focus. It's, it's, that, it's that one. And as put there in that colloquial term that we use in this country, it's that one... Mm, She'll be right, mate. It's that one sort of link 
that that you click that we click because we weren't paying attention. It's that one ignoring your gut check when a strange sales order or invoice comes into the business and like mm, not too sure, but I don't really want to bother. I don't want to speak up. It'll be all right. It's those ones that actually let the cyber crime into our businesses and homes. And look, so most of us are thinking about uh, when we think about cyber crime or cyber security, we're often thinking about that guy squirreled away in a computer, uh, you know, in, in a cave somewhere, um, trying to hack Amazon Web Services, you know, 256 bit encryption. But the far easier sort of weak link in the chain to exploit is not the data centers directly, it's actually us. It's that person that's oh, I'm not wanting to be a bother or look, I think we're pretty fine in this regard. And you know, it's not something that's going to happen to us. It's that type of approach that, that we have, that she'll be right mentality that, that leaves us vulnerable. And so to bring that into concrete, start to bring that into concrete terms and specifically for mid-market businesses, what we see is there's a really sort of interesting dynamic at play where uh, not sort of individual and small, but they're not massive. And that's really where the gaps start to appear uh, for cybercrime to infiltrate. Small businesses, as the name suggests, are small. And so processes are simple. And, and while they don't have the technical capability and complexity uh, to deal with cybercrime and fraud, uh, because of their size, it only takes one business owner or a couple of key people in the business to review every uh, invoice, uh, set every password uh, and, and sort of educate and manage the systems and, and use themselves and their personal education as that stopgap for things like fraud. Larger organisations, as we saw on the first slide, they're obviously not immune from being targeted, but the complexity um, and the high complexity of those types of businesses means that the resourcing that goes into um, dealing with that complexity is high. And so, not just one person or one team, these sort of businesses have multiple teams, but their only job is um, to focus on the IT systems, setting up dedicated firewalls, managing single user sign-ons, and they, of course, have the, the resources at their disposal to really enhance the technical capability to match the process quality and, and the business complexity that much larger organisations have. So then we come to that sort of piggy in the middle where um, being like a lot of the small businesses and, you know, possibly if you're on my advance, you've grown out of account right live and sort of grown from being a small business. Mid-market businesses have that really unique position where they're not one or the other. They're still dealing and have to manage cash flow. And so the resources aren't immediately available to set up a whole account team. They can't bring in necessarily IT consultants and, and have their systems checked. And also at the same time, putting more people on, you know, still working through those growing pains of the business size. And so what we see is that the process quality still stays low because there's so many other things to do with a growing business. But in that, that's where that complexity is coming in and that desk disconnect starts to, starts to creep in. So that's where it really, for us, relates back to mid-sized businesses that we find that they're the ones that are really crying out for solutions in this area uh, because um, they, just trying to uh, you know keep up with the growth of the uh, of the business, and so not too much more to touch on. Really, want to get to as I said, keep it sort of light and and, and easy for you. Um, th there's a lot more information out there, so sort of really want to take this sort of bite to the time and give you some actions that you can actually take into your business tomorrow. Sort of four key sort of areas. Um, one of the biggest ones for me is actually just know thy enemy, know the attack vectors know the types of ways that uh, cybercrime can enter into your business. Now, this list on the page here is no means by an exhaustive list of definitions. There's, an, there's a lot of complexity in terms of ways that uh, cybercrime enters a business, but these are the ones that we feel that are really sort of important. And, and a lot of them start with the head of the snake with the, the phishing and messaging scams. This is that uh, suspiciously looking email that has a link in it. It's the tech me text message that seems to be from Telstra, but has a link or or a uh, incorrect phone number to call back to. Um, it's even the accessing social media and those types of things on work devices that uh, just needs one to person, be it either in your organization 
or in supplier or customers organizations that allows them access into the business systems. And from there, that's when they can wreak havoc, be it with business email compromise, where they sort of pose as someone in the business and uh, a staff member uh, and typically try and get bank details changed for, 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 for payroll um, or um, submit um, fraudulent sort of future invoices, hoping that they'll get paid um, with the team not aware that hasn't gone through an approval process. But also on the right hand side there, malware is something that we've um, known and always heard about. Uh, importantly, malware now doesn't get into your system by uh, the, the the burnt CD or the or the, the the manual installs of software. It does come through the phishing links and through the the general course of doing business um, and through email and the internet and that type of thing. Of course, ransomware is just that type of uh, malware where um, the the exact approach is to uh, hold the business to ransom by encrypting critical information and, and securing that for, for for payment. And so. Again, it's not an exhaustive list and they might be things that you've heard of and know of before, but knowing these is the first step in, in starting to protect your business. But you don't just have to look at these definitions and start to think, extrapolate out, oh, is my business covered in that regard or have we got enough in place or not? The, the ACSA do have um, some resources and tests and that type of thing that you can do. So you can go on, you can jump in and assess your business and get a really frank sort of breakdown of where it is that you sit as an organization. And then on the back of end of that, they do give you the tools and strategies and resources to start to address any of those vulnerabilities. So you're not left to this uh, on your own. I think the biggest thing um, for, from my perspective when, when talking to businesses is that the people are actually the, the best line of defence and often the first and last line of defence. And so to starting to work into your business conversations and, and helping your finance team and empowering them to actually start to foster a culture of protection that is something that's not just about a one and done password management system that gets rolled out or anything like that. It's something that's constantly in, in the conversation. As much as there's sales reports, P&Ls and all those types of things, that protection and, and fraud mitigation are things that the business is constantly talking about. We talk to a lot of finance teams with what we do, and one of the common things that they lament to us about is the fact that they always um, feel like they're the ones that are the bother when they're asking for requisitions, following purchase order processes, uh, restricting access or providing access. Everyone feels that they tend to be a bit of a drag on the business. So if you do sort of um, uh, a, a business owner or in, in the directorship of the business, we really encourage businesses to empower those teams as much as possible and, and not just the resources, they're quite good at providing those, but talking to the rest of the business and having them understand why it is that, you know, um, Lucy in accounts is nagging me all the time for an approval. Well, it's not so that she can be, be a drag. It is just so that she knows that what's getting paid is correct and it's going to the right places. And that when she comes to run your payroll the following week, that the money's still in the coffers and hasn't been siphoned out through a, a fraudulent attack. And so a number of things on this list start to seem fairly common. The other one I'd probably call out is sort of 2FA. It's something that as an individual, we always feel a little bit pained when we've got to get our phone to put in the number to log into the system. Why isn't my password enough? It's actually one of the most effective ways to protect your business systems. When you have a larger business and you can't control every passphrase that's going to be used across the business, 2FA or multi-factor authentication is a great way to protect the business. And then lastly, as we're sort of touching on here, is as you engage with all staff and educate them on the importance of cybercrime and protecting your business, that in doing that, you demonstrate that it's okay for them to speak up, that when they are that one that has something that isn't passing the gut check, that they don't feel like they're a pain on the finance team, on their colleague or on you, that they feel okay to actually just check it with someone else. Um, the real vulnerability is when people turn insular within a company, they don't wanna be a bother, so they just, go about that business process assuming that it's okay even though it seems a bit off and then lastly this is the old classic but it's you know even important um, even if you are using cloud systems like advanced is to update and back up um, as often as you can of course um, 
the more systems that move online, the more um, momentum and those types of packages can, and like advanced can help with updating and backing up. But often it's the adjacent softwares. It's the, the old computer that's still running Windows 7. It's the old version of Outlook or Microsoft Word that, oh, it's still working, so it isn't really a problem. It's those systems and, and those uh, vulnerabilities that, uh, fraudsters use in order to get into the business and then wreak havoc across the other systems, email and, and that type of thing. So it is important as ever. One of the biggest reasons is not just that it's not working anymore, but it is to protect the business is why you, you would um, update and back up. And then lastly, even because I go through a list just like that, and it's again, it starts to rise the water level and it starts to come overwhelming, is actually just get in and embrace the quick wins. This is something that businesses need to build into their normal cadence of doing business. And just like you uh, lock the doors, turn off the lights and take out the rubbish to secure a physical location to make it safe and secure, it's the same with your digital processes. But you don't have to do it all at once. There are some resources and some quick wins that you can start with, be it password management, be it the website, be it portable devices. You can pick and choose where is the best place for your business to start. And the most important thing is just to slowly chip away and, and embrace these um, improvements and examining the business for these vulnerabilities, that that's the way that you keep yourself safe. Quite often, because these types of attacks are broad, they're not attacking any particular business directly. They're attacking thousands of businesses across the economy to find the ones that have that weak link that then lets them in and to wreak havoc on a particular system. If your business doesn't have that unlocked door, it doesn't have that vulnerability, they just pass through the digital world past your business and you don't even know that you're that you're an, a, a potential uh, you know, um, target or, or um, have a threat land at your doorstep. So as you do that over time and, and commit to that, along with your staff and your finance team, they're just some of the ways that you can make sure that you're not one of those businesses that has a, a payment directed incorrectly or uh, an incorrect employee entered into the payroll system that in, unknowingly gets paid over time. Um, yeah, they're just a few of the things that we know are really important and they can start to help you, um, you know, take actionable steps to protect your business. And with that, a bit of a mouthful, so I'm quite happy to, uh, to to hang about and answer any some questions about anything particular that you saw there. Uh, keep in mind as well, um, whether it's engaging with Momentum or with Trail directly, um, we are on hand um, to talk about uh, items that you know might be important. My email address is simply mark at trail.com.au. So reach out to uh, your contact at Momentum if you wanted to speak with us more directly. But again, and you know, we know with our chats with Momentum, this is something that they're pretty passionate about protecting and, and talking through you as well. So we are on hand, happy to answer some questions now, but also on hand as you move forward and take the test or work through these things as you move forward. Uh, thank you, Mark. Really appreciate the presentation there. And uh, I think a lot of great information for um, Momentum customers to be aware of and, and also importantly put into practice. So uh, thanks for that. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, feel free to unmute and fire away with any questions that you have, or if you prefer to pop something in the chat, uh, go for it. Um, whilst you're thinking about it, I'll just recap what we covered today. So we had a great um, presentation from MYB on uh, their uh, direction with cloud and uh, MYB advanced, uh, the upgrade schedule uh, and features. Glenda then took a deep dive into a number of those features in the spring, uh, sorry, the autumn release of MYB advanced. Uh, and we finished the first hour with Arsenio uh, talking about Microsoft uh, cloud solutions like Power Apps and Power Automate and Power BI. Uh, and then the last hour, we've had um, a few updates from Momentum on upcoming end of year things and single touch payroll. Uh, Glenda's taken us through uh, bank feeds and bank feed rules, uh, as well as how to update your own financial statement reports, which was fantastic. Um, and lastly, Mark from Trailed on Cybercrime. So quite a bit of content this afternoon. Uh, hope it's, uh, you found it meaningful and useful to your business. Uh, we always interested in receiving feedback, uh, what we can do better, what things you would like us to cover in future events. 
Uh, so thank you for attending this afternoon. Um, I'll stay online for a minute or two uh, to see if there's any questions. That's all for me. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. See you next time.